What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. So we have a 67 year old man who presents to the emergency department. So we have an elderly gentleman, he's, he's presenting to the ED, he's got acute onset, severe lower back pain. So acute onset, severe lower back pain, that obviously could be MSK. It also could be a tumor or an abscess compressing on the spinal cord, some kind of pathology uh, compressing the spinal cord, causing acute spinal stenosis. It also could be an abdominal aortic aneurysm as well. His vitals are 37.6 degrees Celsius, so he's not running a fever. Heart rate is definitely high at 103. Blood pressure 160 over 94, that's definitely concerning, very hypertensive. And then respiration rate of 22, so he's definitely breathing faster than normal. However, there's no significant findings on physical exam. So that would tend to make me less suspicious of a tumor or an abscess causing acute spinal stenosis because with that, you're going to see severe leg weakness. Bilaterally, you could see uh, urinary or bowel incontinence. You would see some kind of changes in reflexes potentially, and you just they're just not indicating that. Patient has past medical history notable for hypertension, diabetes type 2, and prostate cancer that was treated successfully with surgery. Now again, you would maybe suspect a tumor if he's had prostate cancer before, especially since prostate cancer is known to often metastasize to the spine. But again, he just doesn't have those symptoms. He doesn't have that acute leg weakness, changes in reflexes, urinary bowel incontinence. So it makes me a little less suspicious that it's, again, a metastasis to the spine. His medications include hydrochlorothiazide, which would be for his hypertension, and then metformin, which would be for his diabetes. He consumes three alcoholic drinks per day, so he's a heavy drinker. He smokes two packs of cigarettes per day, so he's a heavy smoker. And then he has a BMI of 37, so he's obese. So a lot of cardiovascular risk factors here. He's got hypertension, diabetes. He's a heavy drinker. He's a heavy smoker. He's overweight. And so definitely risks for not only coronary artery, artery disease, stroke, but also for aneurysms as well. And remember, that's one of the things we're considering here. So an abdominal CT scans reveals an abdominal aortic aneurysm dissection. And so he undergoes emergency surgical repair. After surgery, the patient awakened to having no feeling in his legs. He's also unable to move his legs. So they do a neurological exam of his lower extremities, and that reveals flaccid tone. So he's lost tone in the muscles of his legs. Zero out of five motor strength bilaterally. So he's got total motor paralysis in both legs. And then absent reflexes and then numbness to pain and temperature bilaterally. However, he is able to sense position and vibration in both extremities. So what do we got here? We have a patient who had aortic surgery for a dissection. And then he wakes up and he's got paralysis of the lower extremities bilaterally. And then he's lost pain and temperature bilaterally as well. However, he has position and vibration. Position could also be proprioception bilaterally. So we got to look at the spinal cord anatomy to figure out what's going on here because he's got some kind of residual effect of the surgery and potentially of his aneurysm that's resulting in these findings. So if we look at the cross section here of the spinal cord, first he's lost motor. So the motor pathways are found here, mainly the corticospinal tract here in red. And you can see that here where he has these corticospinal tracts in the lateral aspect of the spinal cord. And then if we go over here and look at the sensory, so he's lost pain and temperature. And that's mainly this spinal thalamic tract here the anterolateral system. So that's traveling here in this, as it, the name implies, the anterolateral aspect of the spinal cord. So he's lost that. However, he has intact position and vibration. And that's gonna be carried by the dorsal columns here. And so the dorsal columns are gonna be these guys here. So what it looks like is that he has a lesion potentially affecting 
the whole anterior lateral aspect of the spinal cord while preserving these dorsal columns. And remember, these symptoms are bilateral, so it's not just going to be one half of the spinal cord. If they were unilateral, you would be more inclined to think that it's one side of the spinal cord versus the other, but the fact they're on both sides indicates that it's, it's a lesion infecting both sides of the spinal cord. So again, if we come back and look at the answer choices here, so spinal stenosis, again, that's, we've ruled that out from an acute standpoint, definitely not going to just all of a sudden develop that after aortic surgery, most likely. It's, like we said, it's more so a musculoskeletal problem, you know, or due to a tumor, abscess, could also be trauma, such as a spinal fracture or something like that. That's also something that could acutely cause spinal stenosis. And if you just think about his past medical history, he doesn't have a history of notable for spinal stenosis. He, does, he's not, he doesn't have chronic low back pain. He didn't have bilateral radiculopathy. He also isn't presenting with that right now after surgery. He doesn't have radiculopathy. He just has numbness. He's numbness to pain. And then also neurogenic caudication, which remember is when patients will be walking and they develop such significant pain in their legs because of their spinal stenosis that they have to stop and rest. And so again, that's, you know, this patient can't even move their legs, let alone walk and then feel the pain. So spinal stenosis does not seem like a likely answer choice here. Hemisection of the spinal cord. So with this, you're going to see ipsilateral loss of motor and position and vibration. So of, the, of that corticospinal tract and then those dorsal columns. However, you're going to see contralateral loss of pain and temperature because the spinal thalamic tract actually crosses over at the spinal cord level. And so that's why it's contralateral. Now, again, you've lost all three of these versus in this patient, they're able to sense position and vibration. The other thing is that the loss of motor is bilateral versus it's ipsilateral because it's only one side of the spinal cord being affected. So again, it doesn't seem to be a hemisection of the spinal cord either. Central cord syndrome is where, if you remember, if you look at your spinal cord and you have that central canal where CSF's traveling, you can develop a tumor or a cyst in there. Often this can happen as a result of trauma in older patients. And as you can see here, if it expands, it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect the dorsal columns here. It's going to affect the corticospinal tract here. And then it's also going to affect the spinal thalamic tract out here anterolaterally. So it's going to affect all three of these. And again, we, and it's definitely going to be bilateral because it expands out like this. But you're going to see bilateral loss of motor, pain and temperature, and the position vibration. You don't spare the dorsal columns typically with this. The other thing is the history just doesn't fit. You're not going to see this after aortic surgery. It, like I said, it's more so due to a tumor or some kind of acute trauma to the spine. So if we look at the rest of these answer choices here, they're blockages of arteries. So let's look at some arterial anatomy to help narrow down these answer choices. So if we look at the blood supply to the spinal cord itself, you have the aorta, he's got an aneurysm of the aorta, and here we have the vertebral body, the pedicle, transverse process, lamina, and then spinous process here. We broke away the pedicle here just to kind of show you the way this segmental artery comes in to supply the, the spinal cord. So you have the aorta here, you have these segmental arteries coming off on both sides to supply either side of the, of the spinal cord, and they bifurcate into these anterior spinal medullary artery and posterior spinal medullary artery. Now the anterior spinal medullary artery comes and connects with the anterior spinal artery, supplies that artery. And then the posterior spinal medullary artery connects with these posterior spinal arteries, which supply the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Now, just to give you a closer up view of this, the anterior spinal artery actually supplies the whole anterior lateral aspect of the spinal cord. So this is all anterior spinal artery versus the dorsal columns or this posterior aspect is supplied by the posterior spinal arteries. So the anterior spinal artery definitely seems like a likely culprit here because if you have an infarction in here, you're gonna block flow to these anterior lateral parts here but spare these dorsal columns. And then again, if we superimpose that distribution of the anterior spinal artery onto this diagram that shows you the different tracks and you see if you lose this aspect here that corresponds again to the anterior spinal artery. As you can see, you're affecting the corticospinal tract and you're affecting the spinal thalamic tract shown here while sparing the dorsal columns back here. Now, infarction of an anterior cerebral artery. Now, this is a cerebral stroke. Now, cerebral strokes can definitely happen during aortic surgery, but again, you got to look at the neurological symptoms. So an ACA would be, remember, contralateral 
lower extremity weakness. If they have upper extremity weakness, which they can with an ACA stroke, the lower extremity weakness is going to be more dramatic. This patient doesn't have any upper extremity weakness. The other thing is it's going to be contralateral. This is contralateral to the side of the brain that contains the stroke, meaning that their weakness is unilateral. It's only on one side versus this patient has bilateral weakness. So again, it just doesn't seem likely that this is it. Infarction of the anterior spinal artery, bilateral loss of motor and pain and temperature, but position and vibration are intact bilaterally. So that definitely seems like our answer choice. Lastly here, infarction of the femoral artery, you're going to have that intermittent claudication, which is where you have lack of perfusion to the lower extremity and you develop pain and unable to walk. And then eventually you could develop limb ischemia if infarction of the femoral artery isn't treated uh, properly. The other thing with an infarction of the femoral artery is you're not going to have this zero out of five total paralysis and loss of reflexes and, and these changes in sensation specific to these tracts. You're just not going to see that with the femoral artery. These are much more indicative of a spinal cord injury. So that leaves us with our answer choice of an infarction of an anterior spinal artery. And unfortunately, this is a complication that can occur after aortic surgery. They're unfortunately very unpredictable, and unfortunately, the outcome is, is, is pretty bleak as well. But this is a, it's a very high-yield topic because it incorporates arterial anatomy with spinal cord function, so you could definitely see this on one of your exams. All right, that's all I have for you this week. Make sure you check back every Wednesday for new Da Vinci cases. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel for more videos, and then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. And if you want to listen to Da Vinci cases on the go, the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about Da Vinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.